Thank you for watching Conscious Consumer Network. The live stream broadcast is free to view. You can pause and rewind live broadcasts to catch up or view shows at a later date by accessing our free archives of all shows. Check out our broadcast guide to see what's on. You can show your support by donating to our network support fund. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter or subscribe to the monthly newsletter for updates. We thank you for supporting free and independent media. If I burn, let me die to burn again. If I burn, let me die to burn Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Herbal Knowledge Keepers with myself, Blue Star, Dear Woman, and Dakota, Granny Woman. And I just want to say we are so happy to be back. Um, I took ill for the past three weeks. Dakota had some downtime, and um, this is my first out of the hat, out of that long illness, returning here to our... Uh, live broadcast and we have a really wonderful show for you today but I do want to share a couple of funny things first <laughs> as uh, uh, Dakota and I were visiting this morning and getting ready for the herbal knowledge keepers I realized that you know there's really several components to Dakota granny woman and the other part is she's an absolute geek uh, she and, and that's demonstrated real clearly in the brilliant herbal database she has put together. Yes, it represents her granny woman self of five generations of Choctaw uh, lineage, but it also <laughs> represents this deep technological uh, granny woman. And uh, put the two together, and we've decided her new name now is Granny Geek. Granny, granny Geek Woman. <laughs> so, and as you may or may not know, uh, this particular show, this live broadcast, is to demonstrate the herbal database. It's to continue to bring it into your vision and share with you how that database works and how it can work for you. And each week, Dakota comes with a presentation as she did today, and uh, we'll do the first half of the show on the presentation using the database to demonstrate how you can do your research and referencing. And the second half of the show, we have decided now that we are going to do storytelling with Dakota. Dakota, <clears throat> Granny Geek, I've probably changed the words around several times, <laughs> Geek, Granny, <laughs> Granny Geek, all right? Um, it's a very interesting story, and you're going to want to know when Dakota gets in these presentations, and she shares this wealth of knowledge and healing and wisdom with you, that you get curious about who is Granny Geek Woman? You know, where did she come from? What's her story? And um, trust me, her story is as phenomenal as the presentation she's put together on the herbal database. 
So the second half of the show, we hope you continue to stick around with us. And uh, we will begin the series of stories to help enrich your understanding of who Dakota is, how she came to be, and how she's come to present this great gift to all of us, the Herbal Database. And we also want to remind our viewers, there's a chat room at the live broadcast location of the CCN platform. You are welcome to join, join the chat room. And that gives you an opportunity as Dakota sharing information if you have questions uh, or if you want to contribute to the conversation. Uh, you're welcome to join us in the chat room. And you're always welcome to email either myself or Dakota with any kinds of topics you would want us to consider in the future. So, on that note, I will now, I'm going to turn this over and Dakota, go ahead and reintroduce yourself again. We've been gone for two, three weeks now. And in the internet world, it's like starting over from scratch if you disappear that long. So, <laughs> that's right. Anyway, we do have shows archived. Um, you can go, for example, to the ultimate herbal database dot online to the blog area, and um, I'm keeping uh, the blog full of our archive shows. So that's one place where you can go. And I suggest that if you haven't seen the first episode, which is an introduction to the database that shows you how to use it, that you do check that out um, and. In this show, we will repeat a little bit of the how-to stuff, but we really want to dig into hypothyroid disorders. Um, as far as introducing myself, I'm here in the Ozark Mountains. Um, I lived in the wilderness for a long time, a complete wilderness, a federal wilderness preserve for uh, 10 years, most of it alone, and have done a lot of other things. So. Uh, bringing all of that experience out uh, to you and sharing with you, I realize that uh, this is a time for healing in our world, and that's really what I'm all about. As Granny Woman, Dr. Revival, helping all of us to understand that ultimately health care is in our own hands and that we need to take our power back and take care, learn how to take care of ourselves and each other. So with the database, you are empowered to do that. Um, but anyway, let's just get right into hypothyroid. It's very, very common and underdiagnosed. It's really interesting to me that in this time of January, which is National Thyroid Month, and also women speaking up all over the world about many issues, but a lot of it around healthcare, that hypothyroidism is primarily a woman's disorder. And that's what I want to touch on first of all, is why is that? Why do women suffer from hypothyroidism? By the way, what that means basically is just a slow thyroid. Everything slows down. It turns out that the body is very intelligent, and the thyroid and its uh, partners, the hypothyroid or hypothalamus in the brain and pituitary gland, are part of our radar system that's constantly checking out the environment to find out whether this is a safe, healthy environment or if there are threats, in particular threats to bringing new life into the world. If it's not a safe environment for a baby to be born in, those areas of our bodies go to work and change a woman's body in such a way that make it much, much less likely that she's going to be doing that. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, Another interesting factoid is during the Irish potato famine, I'm sure most of you heard about that, where a huge part of the population in Ireland died because they, they really lived on potatoes and they were gone. So people died of starvation. Well, it turns out the survivors 
most of the people who survived the Irish potato famine were women with hypothyroid. So what happens in hypothyroid is that uh, there are numerous little bits of information coming into the body telling us about uh, what our exposures are in terms of toxins in the environment. Is there enough food to keep the body going and keep the metabolism up? Um, what is there? Is there a threat in our family life? Are we in danger from people or animals? And if any of those kinds of threats exist, then what happens is the thyroid, and by the way, when we talk about thyroid, it's a little bit misleading because on the one hand, we're talking about the thyroid gland, and we'll get into that in a bit. But when we say thyroid, we're also talking about all of the thyroid hormones and what those hormones do in the body. So thyroid is used in a real broad sense. At any rate, it's in charge of metabolism in the body. And if it's not a safe environment, in terms of what our natural physiology requires, then the body wants to go into safe mode. It wants to uh, withdraw as much as possible from all of the exposures that we have to whatever it's seen as a threat. And so the metabolism slows down. That's helpful if there's not enough food, for example. So when we're fasting or there's actual starvation, the thyroid will tend to go into, if you're lucky, a hypothyroid or slow thyroid state to slow down metabolism in the body so you don't need as much food to live. It's going to want to store fat against whatever kind of uh, misfortune may lay ahead. And so in hypothyroidism, one of the things that happens is we'll tend to put on about 10 to 20 pounds of extra weight. Even if we haven't changed our diets, even if we're exercising, it's all about getting some fat on our bones just in case. Then the other thing that happens is that the thyroid hormones play a huge role in um, what's going on in the brain, with our mood, with our thinking. And so if there are threats, it wants to, again, remove us from all of that. And one of the ways it does it is through this withdrawal that can be called depression. Um, there can be just this kind of an anxiety that something's wrong. Um, so there are a lot of different areas that hypothyroid kicks in when it's trying to uh, work as a survival mechanism. Some people call the thyroid or hypothyroid as the canary in the coal mine. When these things, alarm bells start ringing, it's a message that there's something in our environment that we need to clean up, that we need to avoid, that we need to change. And it could be chemical. It could be the actual physical environment. And it can also be the psychological environment. Um, and, oh, I didn't mention that with hypothyroid, one of the other areas it touches on is fertility. So people who have hypothyroid, it, it, especially when it's more advanced, have difficulty conceiving. So infertility is an issue. And miscarriage occurs. And if there's chronic miscarriage, uh, one of the areas to look at is the thyroid. But those are all the kinds of things that we want to be examining if there's low thyroid. In Instead of, or maybe in some cases in addition to just taking thyroid hormone, like Synthroid, to up the thyroid, because that's kind of working against what the body is trying to tell us that it needs in order to do well in the world. There's something we need to change. So I have a question. So basically when we're treating 
the thyroid with that kind of medication. We're not allowing the thyroid to really continue its communication. Uh, yeah, well, un it, it is in the sense that some of the alarm bells are still going off um, outside of the thyroid. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get into that a little bit when I bring up the database. Okay. But, um, yeah, it's short-circuiting some of the communications, and so we're continuing to be exposed to whatever those threats are that are damaging. The damage continues. Right, so it's like we're trying to bring our thyroid into balance, but do what if we're putting a medication in there to bring it to balance? My concern is are we actually answering what needs to change? No. No. Okay. Um, right. I, before I bring the database up, another mm -hmm. thing I'd like to mention, again, harking back to this being primarily, not entirely, but primarily a women's issue, mm -hmm. something like 90% or 80 to 90% of hypothyroid occurs in women. Mm -hmm. um, but at the early stages, it shows itself as fatigue and depression, mm -hmm. primarily. And in medicine, like when you go to the doctor, if a woman goes to the doctor feeling depressed, what happens? Do they check her thyroid or give her an antidepressant? Mm -hmm. An antidepressant is not going to address it, the mm -hmm. thyroid issue. Mm -hmm. Um, it could be weight gain. If she goes somewhere um, gaining weight and it, uh, the standard response is, well, eat, eat less calories and exercise more. But that doesn't, isn't going to make any difference. It's almost like uh, what I'm hearing is the thyroid. It's almost like it doesn't have to be a condition. It's just that the thyroid is the communicator that there's certain things that have to be addressed in the body. Mm -hmm. But we so quickly make things a condition, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And yet, really, what you're educating us about here is how the thyroid communicates and what it's communicating mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we're learning, you know, okay, what are the what's the language of the thyroid? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another problem that women face with this disorder is a lot of it goes undiagnosed because the symptoms can be so broad. Uh, the thyroid is one of the organs that communicates with every cell of the body, and every cell of the body needs thyroid hormone. The thyroid hormone works with the mitochondria, which are these little energy factories in the cells, to produce the energy that runs our bodies. Thyroid does a lot of different things. Uh, so when there's not enough of it or too much, which is hyperthyroid, the um, energy state of the cells of the body is thrown off, and then all kinds of things that can happen. Um, depending on the weak spots in the body, it can show up in different areas. Um, it can show up as menstrual problems, for example. Um, it can show up as gut issues. It can show up in so many different ways that we think of it as well, you know, we don't think of it as, as an issue with thyroid, can really. Mm -hmm. And also, um, because of the way that conventional medicine has, and medical doctors have been um, uh, taught to think about women, women are often just dismissed in the doctor's office as being just kind of like overly sensitive, um, you know, emotional, reactive. Mm -hmm. And so when they go and complaining of these kinds of things, it just, it tends to be dismissed. And just, it's really easy just to make some kind of general recommendation given a general kind of a drug. And if the doctor does check for thyroid, and we'll get into that, the model that they're using is old school. It's not accurate anymore. And so it's, it's not going to serve us very well. And I'll, I'll show you how 
you can get some uh, really good effective diagnosis for thyroid disorders. But the bottom line here, I just want to say, is um, that checking the thyroid whenever there's serious fatigue, which sometimes we think of as adrenal fatigue, but it could be thyroid. And by the way, there's a, a link between the two. Um, whenever there, somebody's suffering from chronic pain, because that's another thing that can occur when, when thyroid hormones are disrupted. Um, whenever there's uh, problems with fertility, obviously, and definitely depression, uh, brain fog can be due to this, confusion. So all of these kind of vague symptoms can relate to the thyroid, and it's just a good idea to look there just in order to get, as you say, this, this message that there's something we need to change in our environment to be healthy. Um, I have a question. What, um, since we're going to be looking at the more innovative, more integrative solutions to these uh, symptoms, yeah, what is the old paradigm diagnosis method? What have we done in the yeah. past? Okay, so... What happened was there's something called the nurses study where there are thousands of nurses that have been followed for many, many, many years. And they've, it's been a fabulous study. But it was used to try to determine what are the normal ranges for thyroid hormones and set that up as a guideline for testing to determine whether somebody's off. Well, it turned out they did not screen out people who had hypothyroid or, or hyper. It was just everybody was thrown into the mix. Mm -hmm. So the average is skewed. Mm -hmm. They test um, initially for, if they will test, and this is in conventional medicine, uh, if you can get your doctor's test, he's going to test first for something called T. SH, that's thyroid stimulating hormone. And what happens is that the hypothalamus is, is constantly evaluating whether there's enough thyroid hormone in the body. It's uh, called a feedback loop. And if it's not detecting enough of the thyroid hormones, and there's more than one kind, then it needs to tell the pituitary gland to give a good strong kick to the thyroid to get it to produce more. So it sends a message to the pituitary to release something called thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. And so the pituitary sends out uh, more of this TSH to the thyroid, which stimulates it to produce more of the, of the uh, thyroid hormones. And the, the main ones that it produces, there's something called T4 and also a, a little bit of T3. Most of what it's going to produce is this um, thyroxine T4, uh, T4. So they'll test the TH, TSH to see if the thyroid is getting enough stimulation from the pituitary. Mm -hmm. If it's getting too much, that could be an indication that the hypothalamus isn't getting um, enough thyroid hormone signals back. And so there may be low thyroid hormones in the body. That's why it's kicking it up. Hmm. Um, and so it can stop there. Now, one of the things about TSH, though, is that it's not constant. It's diurnal. It changes uh, twice, at least twice a day, and it can change by as much as 50%, which is a lot. So let's say the doctor takes a TSH reading, and according to the old model, if it's, um, it can get, be up to 4.5, and that's considered normal. He's probably not going to even treat anything unless it goes up to 10. 
Now he should take, if it's a 10 or above, ideal, he's going to want to take another TSH test just to verify. So let's say that he is getting a high TSH reading. Then the next thing he's going to test is something called the T4, what the, the thyroid's actually pumping out. And we'll get into that a little bit more in the database. But then he'll test for the T4, and that's the total T4. Um, but that's not enough, and I'm going to show you why. So part of the problem and the change is, is that since that original range was set up, other studies have been done to show that it's a much lower threshold. It should, the TSA shouldn't go any higher than 2.5. So it's if it's over 2.5 and what the doctor's office is going to tell you is normal at 4.5, it isn't. It's not even close to being optimal. And that's why a lot of people are having problems and the doctor's saying, hey, there's nothing wrong. You've got a normal mm. TSH reading. Mm. And as you'll see, there are other areas that need to be looked at because a whole lot can go wrong in to the way the cells, for example, are taking in thyroid mm -hmm. hormones. It, the thyroid hormone itself can be blocked. And how accurate could that be in measuring uh, the cells in each individual? I mean, right there, yeah. they, they've come to some average 4.5, and, you know, ignoring that 2.5 is more appropriate to give it attention. Yeah, well, in functional medicine, if you go to a functional medicine doctor, they're mm -hmm. going to use the 2.5 as mm -hmm. the upper limit. Mm -hmm. And um, and they're going to use other uh, tests, which I'm going to show you. And fortunately, um, we have through the internet some liberation. So if your doctor just is not going to run the full thyroid panel on, on you, you can have it done online. And I'll show you, we've got the information in the database how, on how to do all that. So, should I bring the database up? Sure, sure. Okay. And I always like having that database available. So, for, uh, and for perhaps uh, new viewers to the Herbal Knowledge Keepers, uh, the database is the theme of and content of this program. And this is where... Uh, Dakota has spent over 10 years uh, developing this project and infusing it with all the references and research and links that you will now witness when she pulls up. Okay, is it there? Yes. Okay, it's there. So when you go into the database, uh, I should say um, that this is a membership kind of a deal. So you'll need to become a member, and it's $15 a month. Um, first month, you can try it out for $5. At any rate, this is the opening screen. And I will just mention a few navigation things in case you missed the first episode. I'm going to go right to thyroid, and I'm using this search box. That search is not a search button. It's just a signifier. So I'm going to type in thyroid just to get to the, this area of the database. Whoops. Got to spell it, right? See, no matching thought. Okay, so here are different categories. Here, I could choose any of those, but I'm just going to go to the top here on thyroid. And as you see, above it, this is a little bit hierarchical in terms of the vertical axis. So at the top, it's part of the endocrine system. Okay? Um, th those are glands that produce hormones. And down here is the information screen related to the thyroid. If I click that upward pointing arrow, it's going to come up. And you can learn about the thyroid gland itself here. Um, at the top of the screen, are links that you can click on to see videos or read horma, uh, read articles. I'm clicking the downward area to lower that so I can see more of the screen. And um, we've got here three major categories. So 
since we were talking about diagnosis, um, I'm going to just go ahead and go to that one to make sure we get that in. Sometimes what happens is the show ends before I'm done. But you can always come to the database, and everything's here, and you can dig into this for all a whole range of thyroid disorders. Uh, it's not just hypothyroid or hyperthyroid or thyroid, thyroid yeah, cancer. Yeah. I want to interject here, especially for new viewers, that um, as you get to see Dakota maneuvering through the herbal database, if you go back to our very first show, we do a very simple, uh, slow tempo of introducing the herbal database. So it's always there, that introductory show, just episode number one. Mm -hmm. So if we're, if we're moving a little more quickly in this now, is now we're hoping that uh, viewers that become familiar with the process and then now see Dakota really digging into the database and demonstrating how it can help us. Also, there are some short navigation tutorials on this site. Um, okay, so here's under thyroid diagnosis, and I'm going to lift the screen up. Okay, there's nothing there. That means this is just a heading, okay? And um, we've got thyroid panel, and this is what you want to have done if you suspect for any reason uh, that you may have an issue with the thyroid, you want a full thyroid panel done. Now, it's okay to start with just the TSH reading, and in functional medicine, um, the, the doctors will start with that to get kind of a feel for it, and they'll also look at your symptoms to see what kind of symptoms. For example, um, with hypothyroid, since it's slowing everything down, one of the symptoms is that you tend to be really cold. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to warm up, and um, and there's dry skin and, and different things like that that the doctors will look at and go, ah, you know, combined with this TH, TSH, I think we need to do the full thyroid panel. So you can go to thyroid panel here, and again, there are links here to functional thyroid lab testing you're going to want to look at this metabolic scorecard, rethinking normal ranges, what your lab results really mean, and the scale matrix. And this right here just shows you what the lab range, and by the way, different labs come up with different figures because they often use just, they're based on the people that they've already tested. Um, so uh, you we haven't talked yet about what these things mean. Hopefully we'll get into this and explain what all of these different types of thyroid hormone are. But you've got your lab ranges here, but you really want to try to go for the optimal range. In other words, um, just because it may fall within what the lab says is normal does not mean at all that nothing's wrong and that it's optimal. And it doesn't take much to... to throw things off so that you have symptoms that you don't want to live with. So, Dakota, is this when you have these uh, lab ratings, this is what you would actually get from lab work yeah. in a traditional environment? Not not traditional unless oh. you, well, I mean, it's available, but yeah. they won't give it. And part of the reason is because uh, the doctors have to operate according to this uh, code. So the code tells them that if they suspect, for example, that you have hypothyroid, mm -hmm. uh, it tells them which tests they're allowed to give you to have it covered by the insurance company, whatever that is. And uh, if these, some of these tests are not in that code, which they probably aren't, the doctors either, well, they may just flat out refuse to do it. Um, or if they do, you're going to have to pay out of pocket for it. Okay. So basically, though, what you're saying is Western medicine is the only place that we can access this diagnosis, access this well, lab testing. Well, like I said, you can have it done yourself. I'll show you. Oh, okay. 
So if you can do it online yourself. But this would be the typical thing that if you went to the doctors and they did some testing on you, you may get this kind of information. Yeah, they probably are only going to tell you the mm -hmm. TSH and the total T4. Okay. That's probably, unless they have a really good reason mm -hmm. to look at these others. Yeah. They're going to just stop there. And as you'll see, that's not enough. Is this um, actually a blood test? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, so and I, 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 there may also be saliva tests for some of this. So anyway, here's information about okay. getting tested oh, online oh. down here, okay? Right. Which test to use? What's the test range? I mean, this is in the database is very complete about all of this. We don't have time to go through all of it in the show, but you'll get the answers you're looking for. So um, with the thyroid panel, that was the, the thyroid panel itself. Um, there's uh, maybe I'll back up here, but I just want to say you've got these other things to look at: testing for thyroid antibodies. So, uh, ninety percent of the hypothyroid turns out to be due to Hashimoto's autoimmune thyroiditis. It's an autoimmune disease, and um, Primary hypothyroid uh, is usually due to a lack of iodine. As you'll see, sometimes chemical disruptors could be the cause of hypothyroid, and it's not autoimmune. You don't, and doctors don't check usually to see whether it's like regular primary hypothyroid or autoimmune Hashimoto's because they only have one way to treat both of them, and that's with something like Synthroid, the um, thyroid drug. The, with, whichever one you have, whatever thyroid issue you have, you're going to get the same drugs, so why do all this testing? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, if it's Hashimoto's, though, you don't treat it the same way as you would if you have um, primary hypothyroid, and um, so it's useful to know, and the only way you can know if you have Hashimoto's for sure is to test for these thyroid antibodies. So what's happening is the immune system is attacking a, a, a couple of areas in the thyroid, and um, there's I bolded out the two different types of antibodies and what they attack in shorthand. One of them is called TPO, and um, that attacks the enzyme that's used to synthesize thyroid hormones. And um, it's elevated in Hashimoto's and Graves. Now, Graves' disease is the autoimmune version of hyperthyroid, in other words, too much thyroid hormone. The thyroid sending out too much, it's overactive. The symptoms are almost the opposite of hypothyroid. Somebody's, instead of cold, they're just really hot all the time. Hypothyroid people sleep a lot. The people with hyperthyroid can't sleep. Okay, and then there's this other um, antibody called um, thyroglobulin. And um, thyroid globulin is used to produce hormones by the thyroid. So when that gets attacked, obviously you're not going to be producing hormones. Um, it's more common in Hashimoto's. So by testing these two, you can get usually an accurate uh, diagnosis along with these other things of Hashimoto's. Now, it is the case Nothing's ever simple, right? Mm -hmm. It is the case that sometimes people with Hashimoto's don't uh, get positive results testing for these antibodies. It's something like 5% of Hashimoto's patients don't test positive. So it can escape. But there are a lot of other parameters to look at. And a good functional medicine doctor or, you know, there, and there are other forms of medicine that uh, look into this at depth. Now, I will, will mention here, Aviva Ram is coming out with a book towards the end of the month, 
that is, uh, I've got it in, it's in the database, um, about uh, adrenal and hot thyroid issues from, and of course, uh, if you don't know who she is, she started out as an herbalist and then got her medical degree. So she's a great combination of medical herbalism and comes from that holistic point of view that we have in herbalism. Uh, were you going to say something? Uh, well, I had two questions, but could you also repeat the name of the woman you're referencing right now? Oh, Aviva Rom. Aviva Rom. A-V-I-V-A-R-O-M. I think it's just a single M. Okay. But you'll find her in here. As we go through this, I'll show you where. She's in these categories. In yeah, the she's in the de oh, uh, the question I had, Dakota, is you used the expression functional oh, doctor. Yeah. Uh, could you explain what you mean by that? So we're at this time as scientific advancements are verifying ancient knowledge, uh, especially in regards to what it takes to heal and cure the human body. Uh, we're waking up that, to the fact that we've known a lot of this all along. Now we have scientific explanation for it and new tools that we can use to help things along. So uh, conventional medicine has, is slowly uh, embracing this and when they do it's usually through calling it something like integrative medicine or um, uh, functional medicine simply means that they're going, that they're combining all of these areas to get to the bottom of what's really going on. So they're the doctors, they they're tend to use a lot, do a lot of lab work uh, to get to the bottom of what's mm. causing this. So that's one of the things that's skipped a lot of the times when folks are looking at thyroid issues with their doctors, they're not looking at why. Why is this going on? Mm. What's un the underlying issue? And there's so many things that can cause it uh, that have to be dealt with to really, really, really get to the bottom of it. So in functional medicine, those are the doctors that will do that. So um, just uh, out of curiosity, do you know who our functional doctors would be in this local area of Eureka Springs, Arkansas? You know, I, I do and I don't. I, I found, I, and I need to put them in the database. Mm -hmm. I found them once and stashed them somewhere handy. Yeah. And now I have to remember where I put them. <laughs> now we may have, uh, we have functional veterinarian. Yeah. Well, are you talking about Zach? Yeah. Right. He doesn't go by that and he's, uh, uh, he's, uh, Zach is, um, doesn't call himself a functional vet. He's, an, uh, he's a, Acupuncture. He does acupuncture. acupuncture and herbal treatments, but he's a full fledged friend as well. Okay. Um, but you know, it's also the other thing with functional doctors is they tend to have a team approach. So mm. they'll have uh, on their mm. team a health coach. They'll have an herbalist. They'll mm. have a chiropractor. You know, everybody's working together to get to the bottom of whatever. So going you on. could say that in our locale that we have each of those components, but, uh, and they may consult with each other yeah. and uh, offer a team approach. I didn't find any functional doctors directly in this area. Mm -hmm. I think I did find one in Little Rock. I think I found three functional doctors in Arkansas, but anyway, yeah. you don't have to get back here. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be good. Actually, that would be good for uh, anyone yeah. who is wanting to experience the bridging uh, this holistic approach to our health and healing to start to identify um, those candidates in your local area that serve some aspect of this holistic approach. So this is how the database works. If you have a question like that and you type it in and you just go directly to the area of functional mm -hmm. medicine. And um, uh, functional medicine, mm -hmm. and um, here's a quote, functional medicine is medicine by cause, not by symptom. Functional medicine practitioners don't, in fact, treat disease. We treat your body's ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We get rid of the bad stuff, put in the good stuff, and because your body is an intelligent system, it does the rest. Nice. So nice. that's kind of the philosophy behind it. 
I had another question. It was back on the comparison of the um, thyroid versus the Hashimoto. Um, and you were saying that uh, they weren't doing a lot of research because they were both being treated the same. Not or something that, yes. Yeah, uh, let me just um, uh, change that around a little bit. Yeah. There is research. There's quite a bit of research. It's just that in the doctor's office, right, they treat both of them the same, so they're not. They don't see any reason to go the extra mile uh -huh. to find out if it's Hashimoto's. Usually, it's uh -huh. like, why would you do that if you're just going to give Synthroid yeah. to Hashimoto, Synthroid to, um, you know, to primary hypothyroid? So let me just. I'm going back to the thyroid disorders here, just to show you. Um, Quickly, I put functional medicine in there because it's one of the few areas that really deals with it. Mm -hmm. You've got hypothyroid. I'm just going to click through this. No, no, wait a minute. Over on the left, these are uh, different categories that are associated with thyroid disorders. I mentioned the environment before. Thyroid disrupting chemicals can be a cause of thyroid disorders. So it's connected. And if I want to uh, get to the bottom of this myself, and that's what a lot of folks are going to do. They, they may not have the money to pay for all this lab tests. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that since 90% or higher of hypothyroid is Hashimoto's, a person could just go, well, you know, I think it probably is Hashimoto's. Yeah. And so I'm going to learn about that and how to deal with it and how to treat it myself. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of things that you do to treat autoimmune diseases in general, but Hashimoto's, are really fundamental basic things about creating a safe living environment. In other words, you eliminate the toxic chemicals. You eat the kinds of foods that support the body. You get rid of foods, and it turns out that things like gluten, for example, can be a real trigger for Hashimoto's. Mm. So, so can soy. So there are different foods that um, you eliminate and others you bring in. We have herbs that support the thyroid. Um, you look at, are, am I in any, in any toxic relationships that I need to change? Because that's good. Are you getting enough sleep? That's huge. So you do things to help yourself sleep better. These are all within our, our, our hands, but you learn about it. Learn about Hashimoto's. You can learn. You'll, you'll know more about Hashimoto's from going through everything in the database than your doctor, most likely. And the question I have, I mean, while I'm listening to this, you know, I always love being as empowered as I can be with, you know, medical things yeah. like, uh, uh, you know, for instance, I'm listening to this and going, now, could we... Uh, be doing these tests. Could we do these blood tests yeah. or does yeah. it really need an elaborate chem chemistry lab? No, it does need a lab, but it does. Yeah, they do those. But again, but through inference, you know, you learn about it and you look mm -hmm. at your own symptoms and you think about it. And you mm -hmm. go, yeah. Okay, for example, Epstein-Barr. Well, I'm not going to, I don't want to jump ahead mm -hmm. myself. Let's just stick with this for a second. Right. Do, the thyroid is extremely sensitive to chem chemistry in general, but toxic chemicals especially. Mm. Um, and so look at this area, thyroid disrupting chemicals. These are all links. A wide range of environmental pollutants, food additives. Um, so you can go through this, but then I kind of broke it down here. Um, these are functional medicine lab tests. If you have the funds and want to go the distance to find out if environmental toxins are affecting you, these are actual lab tests that can be done to find out for sure what, what chemicals are hitting you. Mm. There's a whole area called halides that's big. And the reason being, you know, when I mentioned the T4 thyroid hormone, right? it's made out of a combination of iodine, mm and um, uh, tyrosine, which is an amino acid, I think a little hydrogen peroxide too, but the main component is iodine. There are four iodine atoms in that molecule, which is why it's called T4. 
T4 is an inactive form of thyroid. So the thyroid hmm. makes all this, you could call it like a storage um, thyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. And it sends that out into the body and, it, and the, that T4 rides on this little protein wrapped around the body and goes into the liver and some other areas where it's turned into the active form. There's an enzyme that strips off one of those iodine molecules. And now since it only has three, it's called T3. That's the active form. And it's that active form. It's, well, it's, both of them are active, but T3 is 20 times more active. And it's really what the body's hungry for. So what happens is iodine is super important, um, but these halides can mimic iodine in the body they're very structurally they're very very similar so what is the halides well bromine they they come in two different shapes so there's a, like bromine and bromide for example iodine and iodine chlorine and chloride okay. mm -hmm. all of those are disruptive to the thyroid because they resemble the iodine that the thyroid uses to make its hormones. Well, it used to be that um, iodine was used in raising and developing the yeast and stuff in bread baking. So we got iodine through the bread, but then they got scared that people might be getting too much iodine. Mm -hmm. So they started, they, they took it out and started adding bromine to the flour. Well, you if you don't have enough iodine for some reason, you're getting a lot of bromine. Your thyroid will start trying to make its thyroid hormones out of the bromine instead of the iodine. And um, so you might be getting a lot of bromine in your bread and crackers and mm. cereals where they're using brominated flour. So you learn to look for flour that says that there's no brom it's not brominated. You're not getting that. A big one is fluoride. And there, there's more in here about that. But the fluoride um, is one of these halides, and we get it in our drinking water, and I'll show you that even the government is saying that fluoride has a negative impact on the thyroid gland. Well, look how many people are drinking fluoridated water, mm. and there's a huge rise in thyroid dysfunction. Right? Okay, so here's agents that affect PSH secretion, there are drugs that people take, medical drugs, um, that affect these things, like opiates, the glucocorticoids, um, serotonin, so some of the antidepressive um, drugs affect these thyroid hormones. We might need you to speak a little bit louder over there. Oh, okay. Starting to get quiet. All right. Um, so here on fluoride, I'm just going to go there because that's such a huge issue. Yeah. Um, and let me put that arrow to bring this up. And where would that show up? With, if fluoride was one of the irritants of our thyroid, would, where would that show up in the lab tests? You can be tested for it, or you can assume. Right. If you're drinking fluorinated water that you have it, uh, it can be in the toothpaste. And also look at, mm -hmm. at what you're buying in the store, like our if you're drinking the beer, is it made out of fluorinated water? If you're mm -hmm. drinking juices or, or eating, uh, you know, packaged foods, are uh, you using fluorinated water? Right. So you can be getting it even if you're filtering out your water. But let, let's just look at this 2000 report, Fluoride in Drinking Water, a Scientific View of EPA Standards from the National Research Council. They say several lines of information indicate an effect of fluoride on thyroid function. Fluoride exposure in humans is associated with elevated TSH concentrations, uh, increased goiter, altered T4 and T3 concentrations, with similar effects on T4 and T3 in, uh, reported in experimental animals. And they, this panel said, the effects of fluoride on various aspects of endocrine function should be examined further. Well, meanwhile, they're dumping fluoride in the water, just business as usual. So anyway, um, but you know, if you're concerned about that, for example, um, you know, you're getting it, you're worried about what's happening, 
to your thyroid and other areas of your body, you could go to this area on fluoride toxicity and learn how to reduce the effects of fluoride on your body. Okay. So um, I'm going to go back to show the breadcrumbs. Oh, okay. Dan, um, let me lower the screen a little bit. This is a, a tool in the herbal database that I just asked Dakota to show us. It's called breadcrumbs. Uh -huh. As you've noted, Dakota just went down a couple of different routes in the database, and now she wants to get back to what she was talking about earlier. She's going to show you the breadcrumbs on the screen. At the bottom of the screen, you'll find areas that you were previously reading. So I can just click on thyroid disrupting chemicals to go back to that one. I think you have to make the uh, database a little higher first to see the breadcrumbs. Oh, we couldn't see the bottom okay. of the page. Scroll. All right. Can you there see? we go. Now we can see. All right. Okay. So start there again. All right. So anyway, yeah, I, but I already clicked on the one I wanted to go to. So with the thyroid disrupting chemicals, these are uh, Splenda. A lot of people are using sucralose instead of sugar. That's a bad guy on the thyroid and the thyroid hormones. Organochloride pesticides are super bad. Uh, BPA, super bad. All of those things disrupt thyroid hormones. So taking Synthroid isn't going to solve that. What's going to solve it is you get off Splenda, you get off fluoride, you get off the organochlorines, you look at some of the drugs that interfere with thyroid hormone, and you, think you learn how to get off those drugs. So um, I'm just going to click over here to hypothyroidism since that's the main category we're talking about. All right, so under hypothyroidism, again, the color coding, just to remind folks, there's color coded to help you uh, get around. And when it's green like this, that means that it's related to a health condition or it's related to uh, some physiology or a method of treatment. These purple colors are phytochemicals. And if it's white, it's probably an herb. It could be something else, but usually an herb. If it's this yellow color, that is a preparation. And since there is a, a hierarchy here in the vertical, um, all of these things underneath are related directly to hypothyroidism. And generally, when there's a treatment, it's going to be underneath. So all of these purple, B12, vitamin E, vitamin C, nobilitin, which comes from citrus, iodine, curcumin, those are all substances that help with hypothyroidism but you need to dig in a little deeper. For example, I, the use of iodine can be very helpful or it can be very harmful. And the reason being, uh, if you are iodine deficient, that could be why you have hypothyroid, and adding iodine can be all you need to do. Um, however, if you have enough iodine and the problem is an autoimmune disorder, Sometimes taking iodine makes it worse, and that's because the thyroid is inflamed. It's not doing a good job with what it has available. Throwing more iodine at it just increases the inflammation. So um, that's an area to look at and why you might want to know if you have Hashimoto's. If you have Hashimoto's, you need to be careful with iodine. Um, Okay, so under hypothyroidism, we've got biofilms um, and hypothyroid, central hypothyroidism. So there's different kinds. With central hypothyroidism, uh, what that means is that uh, there is not, the thyroid isn't being stimulated enough to produce hormones. And... Um, uh, this is not a common um, form of hypothyroidism. Here's a test that you can, you can take to find out if that's the type of hypothyroid problem that you have. Okay. Um, let me go back up to this.
Now Hashimoto's autoimmune thyroiditis is our big guy and we'll spend a little time here because um, this is what you're going to want to know about most of you who are dealing with thyroid issues. So here I'm going to raise the screen. Look at all of the instructional videos you can go through. I mean, you can really, really dig into this big time. Um, here are some synonyms. Sometimes it's called chronic thyroiditis. Um, and uh, now let's close the screen and look at what else we have. If you want to be looking at how to diagnose it, just click on this link. And uh, it gets into the details of what you're looking for. But let's go to, uh, oh, wait a minute, I wanted to go to causes. Oh, well, we're going to go to treatment instead. Uh-oh. I lost my screen. I lost my screen. I clicked on the wrong thing. It's okay. All right, now here is where you'll find uh, Aviva's. Uh, Aviva ROM under Hashimoto's treatment, breaking the cycle naturally. If you click on that link, which I just did, um, it will take you to her site where she does a lot of work with that and and uh, tells you more about what to test for and how to treat it. And also shows you where to buy her book, which I recommend. Uh, the, here's a treatment checklist. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to raise the screen. And let me get centered here. All right. So here's a treatment checklist you can go through. Now, one of the big players for uh, hypothyroid, whatever kind of hypothyroid it is, is selenium, which also helps with um, um, hyperthyroid. So here's some studies about selenium. And um, this is one of the areas that folks start with is making sure they have selenium. And the reason is selenium is needed to turn that T4 into T3. So if you're selenium deficient, you may not be converting enough of your T4. And you may not have enough active T3 in your body, which the hypothalamus is going to think means you don't have enough thyroid hormone. And so it stimulates the thyroid to produce more, which raises that TSH reading. It gets a little complicated, but then uh, antivirals. Um, you'll learn about how viral infections can be the cause of hypothyroid and other autoimmune diseases. Here's some antiviral herbs and substances. And then here's the information on taking iodine, Vitamin D is, is really useful. Um, vitamin D preparations may reduce thyroid autoimmunity, especially in women who are taking Synthroid. Um, and then uh, MAC is a precursor to glutathione that's very helpful and there's some studies. This herb, Bacopa, also called Brahmi, has been used successfully. So these are just a few of the things, starting places for you. Um, they're all safe. However, with selenium, you do need to be careful um, because if you have take too much selenium, it can cause hypothyroid-like symptoms. So the safest form, which is located here under the Hashimoto's treatment, let me click on this. This is the safest form. It's a, a type of amino acid that has selenium in it. And um, this is the recommendation and the use for this form of selenium. Now, you can also get safe selenium from eating Brazil nuts. Uh, it's a little more difficult to dose for hypothyroid. Four Brazil nuts a month provides the normal person the normal amount of selenium they need. But if you have a condition like this, you might need more. So... Um, learn about this L-selenomethionine. It's a uh, methylated form of selenium. This is safe. This is really your best bet for a, a place to start with treating Hashimoto's. Learn about that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go back to the Hashimoto's treatment. We'll just take a little bit 
more time there because I'm sure that that's what a lot of people are interested in watching this. Um, okay, myrrh essential oil, avocado oil, coconut oil, L-carnitine, uh, different types of phenolic compounds, and these are found in our colorful fruits and vegetables, particularly the vegetables. And so one of the things we want to do is really increase our intake of organic vegetables and, and citrus fruit too, because that's where the nobilitin is. Um, B1 helps. Uh, we, we've talked about vitamin D already. Here's your NAC. And of course, when you click on any of these, you get all kinds of information about it. Uh, green tea. Um, now, one of the issues, so you can just, you can go as far as you want in digging into your own uh, understanding of your own body. But one of the uh, issues that some people have that leads to some of these disorders, these autoimmune disorders, is something called vitamin D receptor polymorphism. Uh, what that means is there is a, you could call it kind of like a, a, an abnormal genetic structure for the receptor that takes in vitamin D. That can be tested for using uh, gen genes testing like 23andMe and there are other ones available. If you have this vitamin D receptor polymorphism, what it means is you need a lot more vitamin D than other people do. And um, since D plays a huge role in autoimmune and especially Hashimoto's, if you're doing all the regular stuff and you don't think you're getting better, you know, you're eating, you're taking these herbs and supplements and um, uh, you're checking to see if there's an a, a underlying viral infection to get rid of. You're doing all that and you're still having problems. And by the way, it's just going to take some time. Um, you could have some genetic testing done to see if you have this polymorphism. Okay, let's go back to treatment. Sometimes the internet's a little bit slow, but not too slow. All right. Um, I want to go to causes because this is also a, uh, an important area. Hashimoto's is linked with other autoimmune diseases. The, what happens is when you get one autoimmune disease, sometimes it kind of a cascade starts and other types of autoimmune diseases occur. Um, breast cancer is uh, linked with thyroid disorders. So if you have a thyroid disorder, all that means is just learn more about preventing and treating naturally any, any signs of uh, uh, potential breast cancer. Wheat intolerance may play a key role in autoimmune thyroid disease. This, these are studies. Now, you can click on them, but I, I'll just tell you, um, when it appears like this in the info pan, information panel, if you click on it, it's going to take you out of the database. So it's better to right-click and then say open the link in a new tab. Okay. Um, a lot on food additives, pesticides, all of these things. Celiac, um, uh, where you live. Again, if you're living near a large industrial plant, your thyroid might be saying, hey, this is not a safe place to have babies. I'm going to make hypothyroid happen and slow down the uh, fertility cycle here. Um, so here's information on viral infections and autoimmune thyroid disease. It's pretty important to know about herpes viruses. Um, there are several viruses. Oxidative stress. Uh, what that means is um, like we have these oxygen chemical reactions in the body that produce these what are called um, reactive oxygen species. They're just really, really fiery and do damage in the body when there are too many of them running around. And that's something that the thyroid gland is real sensitive to. So if you don't have enough antioxidants to tame those things, to quiet them down, they can start causing inflammation in the thyroid gland itself and, of course, other areas of the body. So that can be a cause. 
We want to deal with oxidative stress. Um, and you'll find lots of information about that in the database. Um, and of course, you can read about it here. Uh, it's also associated with diabetes. And then the endocrine disruptors. These are three big causes right here. And endocrine disruptors, I showed you those uh, chemicals that disrupt the thyroid. Those are endocrine disruptors. Okay, so where are we with time? We're good. Okay. We're about uh, 10 afternoon. <clears throat> uh, and it's, I think as long as you uh, come to your organic closure here. You know, I never do that. You know, I can just keep going. <laughs> you can just keep going. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right, let me just take a moment. I know that uh, it looks like we have several viewers that are watching live, not necessarily in the chat room. And uh, Vicki, if you could flash just our phone number on the screen, because you can also call in uh, if you have questions. If you would prefer to just call in and ask any questions or offer any information to the discussion, you are welcome to do that. And um, uh, I do want to show something that just happened here as, by way of review. Mm -hmm. When I clicked on um, this main heading of Hashimoto's, uh, the, uh, there are too many things on the left to see, so this bar popped up. Mm -hmm. That's a scroll bar. So if I scroll down now, I'll see all of these other categories that are associated with it. Uh, Yersinia can result in um, Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. um, an H. pylori affection is associated with that. Um, these polychlorinated um, uh, chemicals are associated mercury. To, so all of these are all areas for you to explore mm -hmm. in dealing with this. And then again, the same thing happened over here. We got a scroll bar, but notice that these are all attached to hypothyroidism in general, not to Hashimoto. So on the right side, it's always going to be stuff that is attached to one of the upper level categories. Um, okay, so also... Dakota, I think it got lost in translation earlier when I asked for you to show the breadcrumbs, <clears throat> the breadcrumb tool of the database because uh -huh. it wasn't visible. Like oh, right okay. now, the bottom is If you could just, I'll click on a couple of things so you can watch it grow. Yeah, watch so, the, um, Under hypothyroid, we have all of these different areas. Overt primary, what's that? Subclinical. Uh, subclinical is when uh, you go to the doctor and uh, you have a, a lab done and it says there's something wrong, but you don't feel that bad. It's like uh, the labs are saying you've got an issue and it might not have a lot to say, but <laughs> they says you have an issue and you might not have any symptoms or they might be very, very mild. And um, but then there's another category, which is called sub-laboratory, which means you have symptoms, but the labs say you're fine. So what just happened was um, the two things I clicked on are here. So that's a breadcrumb trail. So as I click through things, the most recent history shows up down here, and I can return to where I was before. So do you feel like uh, you're ready to move on to storytelling time? Are you, or is there any other things here? Well, we'll just see if anyone checks in with us. Okay. Um, or actually, was there any particular questions that you've had people ask you about uh, recently, either via online, social media? Oh, good. And uh, Biggie's got the phone number up there. Right now on the screen, anybody who'd like to call in, please do that. You know, join us. It's a, a very friendly atmosphere here. You can come on in and smooze with us um, and add your insight as well. But um, to finish that question, Dakota, has anyone asked um, any particular aspects about these conditions that they wanted to know? Did you cover that for them? Um, well... The um, 
issue about iodine, um, mm -hmm. because that comes up a lot. We know that iodine is needed by the thyroid and uh, whether to take it or not, it, you know, that's a tricky one because it can make you better or it can make you worse. Mm. And uh, so uh, my answer to that is try to find out if you have Hashimoto's first of all. Mm -hmm. And if it is Hashimoto's, then you need to be careful. Um, and I would, if I'm using it, I would use a very low dose atomic uh, iodine like, um, uh, oh, it's just slipped my mind. It'll come back. The brand? Is that what yeah, you're trying to read? Yeah. Um, it, but it, it is in here. So uh, you have to be careful with that. And then also someone was talking about their situation and uh, thought that their their hypothyroid was issue was due to the pituitary, that it was a pituitary problem. Mm -hmm. And I would just say to that that uh, usually it's not a pituitary problem. Mm. Uh, the pituitary is doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, the TSH readings don't reflect the pituitary being a bad guy. However, sometimes where the doctor might want to check the pituitary is when the TH, TSH level goes real, real low. Mm -hmm. If the TH, TSH level is super low, that could be an underperforming pituitary gland. So mm -hmm. that's when it's checked out. Another thing I haven't mentioned yet is that another one of the areas that this hits is the heart. Okay. Um, heart cardiac arrhythmia can occur with hypothyroidism. So uh, ladies, if you're having palpitations, uh, um, any kind of cardiac arrhythmia, have your thyroid checked because that could be related mm -hmm. to that too. Okay, a reminder, don't be shy. The <laughs> phone number is up on the uh, broadcast live window. Uh, and just call in, and you can also come into the meeting ID. Uh, you don't have to have your video on. Just if you want to check in and have a conversation, um, we're both here. Be happy to engage with you. And we're going to encourage this more and more. You know, just for that interaction. Yeah. You have the opportunity for live folks. Yeah, we like that. Uh, one thing I'll also mention is that uh, the liver, I, I think I said something about this. The liver is where most of the T4 is converted mm -hmm. to T3. Mm -hmm. So if you have liver problems, so this that's one of the ways this can start rolling along, is if you have liver problems, you may not be converting um, enough of the thyroid hormone, and that's why you're having these symptoms. Um, so there's just so many areas that you could really look at. Yeah, and uh, but you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah, and I think I think what we're um, laying out here too is that recognition that oh goodness, there's so many parts of ourselves that need attention, and how many times do we hear about the story? You go to so many doctors and yeah. so many facilities, and you've done all this research, and, you know, three years go by, and you still don't know why mm -hmm. do you have these symptoms. Well, I think now what we're, what we're introducing and what is becoming more and more popular on our planet in our healing uh, modes is that it's time to really reflect on every possible aspect Look at your emotional body, your spiritual. What are you thinking about? What are you eating? What are you drinking? Uh, and now even down to the very core of, you know, uh, these lab tests. What's happening on the micro level? Um, it's time to really just like, whew, there's a great picture out there. Don't get frightened. Yeah. Just know that we're expanding in our knowledge. And we are the knowledge keepers. Right. And in, in herbal medicine, mm -hmm. um, which is the kind of medicine that we've had successfully in different cultures all over the world, mm -hmm. there's a therapeutic order, a place to start 
And the place to start is laying the foundations for health. So no matter what is wrong, you lay the health foundations first and build up from there. So, um, and, part, and the database, of course, does cover that a lot, especially in this therapeutics area. But uh, the, the, what are the foundations for health? It's very, very simple. Clean air, clean water, uh, relaxation, sleep, healthy social relationships, mm -hmm. um, organic, mineral-rich food. That's another area uh, mm -hmm. where our agriculture has uh, mm -hmm. caused a depletion of the mineral content of our food. So even if it's organic, doesn't necessarily mean that the soil was rich with all the minerals we need. So we pay attention to getting the minerals we need, uh, staying away from these chemicals. All of these things, right. no matter what is wrong with us, <laughs> mm -hmm. is, are going to be building the foundations for health. And there are many, many stories of people who have completely recovered from really crazy, scary conditions. Right. Uh, but just by doing these things. So this is yeah. where we start. And just know you add in a few things knowing that in this condition, selenium is a major player. Mm -hmm. So uh, eat your Brazil nuts. By the way, with Brazil nuts, you want to keep them, buy them fresh, keep them refrigerated so they don't oxidize. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that four nuts a month is an adequate supply of selenium for average people. Um, you want to pay attention to your zinc. Um, you don't want too much copper. That's something that in the database, I just pulled up, by the way, this iatrogenic hypothyroidism. What that means is it's caused by the medical system, by drugs. A lot of the hypothyroidism is a result of the drugs people are taking. But um, let me just pull up copper because this is another big player. All right, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna reel you in, uh, Dakota Granny Geek woman. Ah, oh, I have to stop. Yeah, I'm gonna reel you in. Well, because in the beginning of the show, I, I promised everyone that we have a new idea here, and we're gonna have storytelling. Okay. On the second half of our show. So. Okay. So here's a bunch of information on copper overload. Uh, this is an issue where you have copper pipes carrying your water. Mm. But that was a big thing a while back. It was like copper is the way to go. Of course, now it's so expensive, probably most people have stripped it out and sold it. But still, uh, there can be too much copper. You don't want to buy food supplements that contain copper, for example. Uh, the thyroid gland is extremely sensitive to copper. Um, so that's just, you know, you look at these things. These this kind of thing puts control in our own hands where we are able to educate ourselves and become our own doctors and help each other. Mm -hmm. And ideally, you know, you do have a team of, of um, experts to work with that have been down this road before. Right. So it's all here, folks. Uh, if you've got thyroid disorders, you can get into the database and, um, and figure it out. And also a reminder here is that <clears throat> Dakota is available for private consultations. Uh, you can always contact her and set up a session where she could uh, go more in depth on your symptoms and um, the education that you're seeking for your own health. That reminder. And uh, I think that, um, again, we encourage everyone to please participate in the Herbal Database. Uh, your participation uh, is one of the ways that we're financially assisted to bring the likes of this program to you. So either uh, sign up for the Herbal Database or make contributions, donations for, the, for this particular show. We greatly appreciate it. And I'm going to have better information in the future on how, um, how we'll make that an easy uh, access for you to do that donation. But in the meantime, you can just contact either one of us, let us know if you want a consultation, you want to make a contribution. And then, of course, uh, you go to the um, Ultimate Herbal Database 
dot online. Okay, and that's where you can sign up for this verbal database. Correct. All right, so yep. now what I'd like to do is we've talked about uh, wanting to have storytelling. And part of that is, I mean, when, you know, you get to do a live show like this, and here's Dakota presenting this extensive amount of resources and knowledge. And at the same time, it's very technological, right? So uh, that's why we were joking in the beginning of the show that uh, Dakota's new name is Granny Woman, Granny Geek Woman, or Granny, Granny Woman Geek, however we want to play it. But you got to recognize there is a crystal rainbow bridge between, again, I will repeat, fifth generation Choctaw, uh, Choctaw uh, lineage of herbology, all right, down to the earth, understanding of healing, and this um, futuristic Dakota geek granny woman who has uh, learned her technology and, and has studied the software to bridge these two worlds. So in our storytelling, I mean, it's like you have to ask Dakota. It's like, uh, how did the likes of you end up being a, a granny geek woman. <laughs> like, where did this all start? I mean, who were you? You know, you were this child and, right, you had some serious healing mm -hmm. that uh, you had a grandmother and a great-grandmother, I believe, mm -hmm. that assisted in really bringing through, you through rheumatoid? Uh, uh, rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic heart mm -hmm. disease. And so you had an early exposure to the healing potency of the earth. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere your scientific self emerged and really started going after uh, understanding the chemicals and the constituents and the science and the biology and the chemistry and all of that. So where would you begin with how did those, when did those two worlds start to come together? I have to say very early on because uh, as you know, in, in telling the story, uh, I lived with my mother and my grandmothers and at the time that my brother and I came down as a result of, of uh, strep throat with these two uh, serious pathologies, in my case, uh, rheumatic fever leading to rheumatic heart disease. In my brother's case, he developed nephritis which at the time was really untreatable. And the doctors really couldn't do anything for us. They um, said, in my case, I had to be on antibiotics the rest of my life. In his case, they just said, well, he's, he'll be lucky to live to be age 12. And um, so my mother, and this was really typical of uh, the viewpoint regarding the, the traditional medicine versus the modern new medical AMA doctor um, system at that time was that the uh, herbalists, the traditional uh, doctors, the eclectic doctors, all those people uh, really didn't know what they were doing, really didn't know what they were talking about because now we had modern medicine that was going to cure cancer and can cure heart disease and going to cure everything. Boom. Uh, and so my mother, uh, you know, she's got two kids that uh, may die. And so she's all about going with the modern medicine and doing what the doctors say, even though they don't hold out much hope. My grandmother, uh, who had been pretty quiet about all this, uh, they, the whole family had been relocated to Colorado, and they were out of their element in the Ozarks. Uh, so my grandmother started speaking up, saying, well, you know, uh, these herbs would really help, and let's look at the diet and all this kind of thing. And a battle uh, emerged in the house between my mother and the doctors and my grandmothers. Um, and, you know, it wasn't a knockdown drag out, but it was pretty serious. Mm -hmm. And here I am, five years old, 
observing this and um, on the one hand, I'm, I'm hearing what the doctors have to say that doesn't really uh, indicate that either one of us is going to recover. And I'm hearing what my grandmother say that this is treatable. We can do something about this. I decided that my I wanted to go with my grandmother's and be cured. Um, my brother fell under the influence of my mother and went with the doctors. I'll say that he did survive to be age 30. He was one of the first people to go on kidney dialysis. Mm. He suffered terribly. My condition did heal. Um, but at any rate, I felt like my life depended on learning about uh, natural healing. Right. And um, so I studied, I learned everything that I could from my grandmothers and continued from there learning about it. And as I went along, I learned more about the tradition of um, the what's called the granny women or the root doctors, these old time doctors that use plant medicine. Not exclusively, but almost exclusively. And that, uh, you know, obviously my family history went through those lines. And um, as I learned more and more about that and how effective they were in Arkansas, for, in the Ozarks, as a matter of fact, it was one of the last holdouts where into the 1930s in a lot of areas, primary care was still in the hands of very effective uh, granny women and root doctors who could do everything. And um, so uh, I, be, I learned about how it died out, and it was primarily because these folks did not speak science. Mm -hmm. They couldn't explain scientifically why it worked. They didn't have a scientific model for why plant medicines worked. They couldn't talk the talk. And so they sounded backwards and ignorant. Uh, I resolved, because I knew from firsthand experience they did work, I resolved to understand the science and bring the science back into the picture uh, so that we could, and I'm not the only one, I'm, there's a, this is what we're doing these days, right. thank goodness. Um, but on, as far as my own mission, I resolved to find how, how they're linked. And it's pretty exciting because there's a lot of new stuff on the horizon that uh, shows us even better ways of healing, using vibrational healing with light and sound. And, um, you know, it's just it's a real exciting time. So that's so what you, got me going. <clears throat> you pretty much made uh, established that in your youth. Yeah, uh, that you realize, okay, this this language has got to be understood too, so we can yeah. bring these worlds together. Yeah. Now somewhere, okay, so now we're going to go forward a little bit. It's like so somewhere after you made that decision, had acquired this, now you're getting scientific knowledge. When and what prompted you uh, to live in the wilderness for ten years? And this is a real significant part of, I would think, what got you totally grounded in all of who you are. Mm. Oh, yeah. So, and I think this is really important. There's lots of stories of when you were in the wilderness, but let's go there now. You know, where in your life did you decide to make that turn? Again, as a very young child, because uh, I, you know how kids kind of, dream about what they're going to be when they grow up and you're trying to find their passion and all of that. When I would do that, I went through all the regular things available to women. You could be a nurse. <laughs> you could be a mother. Yeah, right. All right. that. Yeah. The one that really caught my fancy was this vision of myself living alone with all of the wild creatures. It might have been a Snow White fancy, I don't know, but mm -hmm. um, living alone with all the creatures deep in the woods. Right. And that kept coming back to me throughout, uh, up until the time that I finally left for the wilderness, frankly. Um, it, it always came to me, it felt like a calling. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would think, well, yeah, one day i got to do that. And then life would get in the way. 
Right. I would have a great job or, you mm-hmm. know, I'm doing this or doing that. And and I could never figure out the logistics about how in the world do you pull that off? Right. Now, this is around your mid-40s? Well, all the way. I mean, I was, oh, all, your, all through your childhood, childhood you designed and it. Yeah, yeah, in okay. 20s and 30s, you gotcha. know, keep coming back, and I go, I, I, well, I'm going to do that, but yeah. i got to figure out how. How do I do that? How <laughs> how do do I do do that? Um, you know, it's like, uh, and I never could figure it out. It mm-hmm. was like, because I was talking about a real wilderness, like, you know, that movie Into the Wild. We're talking about those people that go to Alaska for a month and they're proud. Because they survived for a yes. long time. Right. I was talking about going there to live forever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how do you do that? And um, so at any rate, uh, that had been a theme all along. And then in my late 40s, I had an awakening that I actually was aging. <laughs> <laughs> that moment. Yeah, it comes like, oh, my God. I can't finish this off. Any longer. I actually am aging. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I can't put this if I'm gonna do this, I better do it. Right. And, yeah, and and I still didn't have a clue mm-hmm. how or where or anything. And um and I did have by that time a lot of good reasons for doing it besides the calling. For example, I was very aware of GMO pollination drift, the loss of heirloom corn, mm-hmm. um uh, all these things, and I thought, well, if I could get into the wilderness with all these really great heirloom seeds, I could grow them out and save the seed and preserve these ancient um, mm-hmm. germ samples. And um, then also another one by that time, uh, I knew a lot about herbs and, and medicinal plants, but I didn't really know how to identify them. Uh, I didn't have an ex- much of an experience um, learning directly from them. I was fascinated in ethnobotany because indigenous peoples will tell you that they learned about the plants from the plants. The plants taught them what they were good for. And mm-hmm. I, I was fascinated by that and curious, could someone who didn't grow up in that kind of a culture also have that access to that kind of knowledge? Mm-hmm. Or was it, would it be filtered out because I had been brought up in like, you know, the kind of urban, for the most part, urban culture, not entirely, but for mm-hmm. the most part, um, was it possible? And um, did and, you know, did you know at the time, as you're asking that question, that it was the sensibilities that could have been cultivated or not in you to hear the plants? I had doubts. I mean, I hadn't heard a plant talk to me mm-hmm. and uh, even say hi, mm-hmm. really, okay. you know. Um, and I didn't know why exactly, but I wanted, that was something I wanted to have an experience mm-hmm. of and get an answer to either yes or no. Mm-hmm. And um, then also um, I had some philosophical musings, like, um, I wanted to know, I've always been a truth seeker, you could say, I don't care whether it's a happy truth or a sad, I want to know the truth about everything. Right. And um, I wanted to know, I had this feeling that if I could um, step into the true natural relationship between human and an ecosystem, mm-hmm. that there would somehow be some kind of support system for me coming directly from nature where not only could I learn from the plants but the animals and and the, the whole natural ecosystem could kind of adopt me yeah and teach me what I needed to know this was it, something that you sensed could happen it was a philosophy I believed that it was possible okay and uh, because I also believed that the universe is probably friendly yes and if the universe is friendly, then you can lean on it, right? Right. It's got your back. So I want, that was a big thing for me. I want to pause there for a moment, Dakota. I think that is one big breath of truth. One big breath of life. I just want to pause there for a moment because I think what you're saying is this is the true, genuine healer of our time is to really take that big breath 
and know in this big moment that we are fully supported mm -hmm. exactly the way we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think mm -hmm. yeah. this is what we so want, mm -hmm. but is but we are so challenged yeah. because it takes a big breath and a pause. Yeah. So I'm well, just, we think that we have to do everything, right? Mm -hmm. That we already have to know everything. That we, you know, it's like, and it's scary because um, to really surrender to the things that we say we believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. A lot of us, you know, and it's kind of a, a part of the spiritual quest to say, well, you know, um, I believe this to be true, but would you bet your life on it? And mm -hmm. so I had reached the point where I said, you know, I, I'm willing to bet my life on it. And, um, and even though I don't have a clue how to go about it or anything, I understood that nothing was going to happen through that route of me mentally putting all the pieces together that I was going to have to go deeper and make a, a real decision to answer that call. And that once I did that, the pieces would come together on their own. So um, that's what I did was I made the decision. I have no clue how or where or when I'm going to do this. It's going to be soon. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this next. Absolutely. And then uh, there's a great book that came out many years ago called uh, Focusing, or maybe it was yeah, focusing, where when you know something, it, you can feel it in your body. It's like there's a sense, a shift, it's where there's this knowingness in the cells. Mm -hmm. And that a real true decision where you know you're going to do something, you feel it in your body. It's no question. Um, so I got to that state where I knew. I just knew I was doing it. I'd made the decision. Now all I have to do is find out where this wilderness is, mm -hmm. how I'm going to get there, how I'm going to survive there without any money or anything. I mean, when I went to the wilderness, it was without money. It was without a car. It was without access to any kind of, um, like, food stamps or anything like that. Um, no communication with the outside world. Um, it was just me and the wilderness. And um, and there's much more to the story. There are human beings that came into the picture periodically, and we'll get into that too. Uh, but at any rate, um, that was the, the big question. So I really did throw myself on the mercy of the forest to adopt me and teach me. And uh, obviously I survived. I, I did get, um, you know, pretty beat up physically from it, but um, it's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's well worth it. And I had intended to live there the rest of my life. Mm. I wasn't going to leave. Mm. And what actually prompted you to leave? Uh, somebody, a dangerous human who was a paranoid schizophrenic showed up. Mm. It was a serious threat to me. Mm. And that's a whole story in and of itself. I'm sure it is. And okay. that's uh, very telling of our times as well. Again, the predator. Yeah, right. Um, but I will say that even that uh, was fine because mm -hmm. before that I had the whole time I was there and the experiences that I had that were just like far more beautiful than I could imagine, all were telling me that um, what I was learning about the wilderness was the story the wilderness would like for people to know mm -hmm. about it, that it's not the place they think it is, mm -hmm. uh, that it's not the scary, scary place. Right. Um, and so I always, always thinking was it's really selfish of me mm -hmm. to stay here and keep all of this to myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like it, it, every once in a while a woodsman would show up absolutely terrified to even be that deep in the woods. Mm -hmm. And then they would, and of course they had their gun to protect themselves. And they'd come across me there without any gun or anything, and their jaw would drop open. Mm -hmm. And they go, how can you do, how can you be doing this? It's like, I could never do this. 
And they were amazed that I was living there that way. And it was, and they told, they would tell me, these are fearless men. They would say, I'm scared to death to, of this place. Mm -hmm. And it made me feel so bad for them. And, and it's just, it's the way it is, I think, in general for most people, this fear. I saw it again and mm -hmm. again, this fear that people had of it. And so I, that was a motivator when I realized, okay, I'm being kicked out of of the wilderness to go back to mm -hmm. civilization. This is obviously something that is a good thing because I have a story to tell about what the wilderness really truly is yeah. and how it takes care of us and how ultimately it's everywhere. So here you are. I mean, really, the experience that you bring is the exact experience we need to be um, having in our everyday lives, mm -hmm. whether we be in the cities or in the suburbs or just, you know, closer integrated communities. But it comes back to feeling safe and secure with the earth, with our sentient selves. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are no different from plants and animals. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we breathe and live. Right. as one family, so of course we're taken care of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we, have, we do need to cultivate that relationship on our side. Yeah. You know, so that's really what it's all about, with healing in general. We have a responsibility to the ecosystem and to ourselves. And so, um, you know, it's a lot of it is it's scary because it's different. Um, some of the things I had to do in the wilderness would have been uh, if uh, most from from the wider perspective of psychology, they would have locked me up as a crazy woman. So oh, yeah, you know, they would have said this. She's been in the woods too long. Yeah, but it was exactly the right thing to do. Exactly. So let's say you have a gold kernel <clears throat> to offer today as the bridge. What would you say that gold kernel is that you experience there and that you experience here that really grows from giving it your attention? Hmm. Well, you know, the, um, there are a lot of, of deep wisdom teachings that come directly from, um, from nature. And um, no one can lay claim to them as being their own. Mm -hmm. I would say one of them, just um, it, it's a little bit difficult to get into at length here mm -hmm. at this, with the time we have, but I would say one of the uh, uh, gold kernels that you can go out and research yourself to confirm, it comes from evolutionary biology where we're always trying to trace the family tree back to the origins of, of you know, mammals, humans, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And in some of the more recent explorations scientifically of that, we've been traced back to flowers. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and I had long felt that, uh, and seen some of the scientific evidence for how uh, plants created animal life and ultimately humans that plants and plants are behind a whole lot of what's going on in, in this world right that plants created humans because it needed gardeners uh, <laughs> I love that <laughs> plants created humans because they needed gardeners I think that's such a beautiful that's a beautiful connectedness to have yeah and I hope we're really good gardeners. Yeah. Well, um, I think that, unless there's another few words there, I think that's a beautiful note to uh, bring storytelling time to a close. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> and we will continue. I think these are the kinds of conversations um, I love having from your stories. Well, thank you. Is to bring us all back to this here and now and and remember that that's a beautiful thought, that mm -hmm. we humans were created 
to be the gardeners for plants, mm -hmm. the gardeners. I think that's really beautiful. And, and uh, may we all take care of each other yeah. in that kind of relationship. Yeah. Think of being gardeners for each other. Mm -hmm. um, this has been one wonderful session once again with you, Dakota, granny woman geek, granny geek woman, okay? We're going we're gonna to continue to address your um, geek and granny woman self. And viewers, I want to thank all of you for being present at the Herbal Knowledge Keepers. That's what this live broadcast is. And for future reference, there will always be a phone number for you to call in or come into the chat room or email either one of us. We're on Facebook. And I want to thank ConsciousConsumerNetwork.tv, Biggie and Mel, for offering such an awesome platform for all of us to have voices here internationally around the world. We are so grateful to you. And um, uh, all our viewers, <clears throat> you can make contributions, donations to Conscious Consumer Network. And <clears throat> again, you can support us by signing up for the Herbal Database. Um, and can I just say something? Yes. Support yourselves by signing up for mm -hmm. the Herbal Database. That's a good way to put it. You know, it really is for you. And um, it's like your access to... Um, well, yes, it's it will empower your knowledge yeah. gathering for all of us. So for those of you that um, you are in the computers and you like to access really cool software, educate yourselves, share it with others. <coughs> so uh, next Tuesday, we invite you back. It will be myself and Rebecca Hahn co-hosting Get Lit, and there's no telling what we're going to bring to the platform. But I can tell you this, we got some exciting things going on in the world right now. Uh, the Women's March is still resonating across the globe. It's empowering all of us in our voices. Stay active, stay local. Uh, that's how we're helping each other globally. Stay present, keep your eyes open, stay alert. Now is not a time to go to sleep. So I want to just share the love with all of you. Thank you again, Dakota Granny Geek Woman. Thank you. And thank you, Biggie, and thank you, everybody who's there. I hope to hear from all of you and get to know all of you. Yeah, right on, right on. Thanks again. We'll see you next week. If we want to change the world, we must first change the media. Mainstream media exists for the purposes of indoctrination and manipulation of public perception. The world of free and independent media is growing, and with the upsurge in information now available in the public domain, it has never been easier to access free and independent media. The exploration of this information resulted in an experimental project which would provide a fully supported space for researchers, whistleblowers, and seekers of all kinds to express themselves and educate the world. On the 1st of January 2015, Conscious Consumer Network was launched to the world. Nobody thought we would make it this far, but CCN is the longest running free and independent media network of its kind. CCN is a unique collaboration of hearts and souls bringing you information from different perspectives to educate and inform. Since we started CCN, we have had only one desire, the pursuit of a free, fair, just, sustainable world, and this has not changed. Having overcome many challenges over the last two years, CCN is here to stay, and we've got great things lined up for 2017. Help keep CCN on the air by supporting the 2017 Network Support Fund.